The Second World War is a modern conflict in every sense of the word. Gone are the days of kings leading royal armies against each other in the field to protect their honor of their kingdoms and in their place to put politicians and military men direct national armies in a brutal clash of ideology. I have a problem with that word. But royal houses still reign as heads of states in belligerent countries across the world. And just like their subjects, they have a role to play in assuring the victory of the reign. I'm Esther Dinehart. This is a World War II in real time special about the role of royalty during World War II, which was written by Fiona Rachel Fisher. Here she is, and I thank her for that. Okay, we have covered the role of monarchies once already, where we looked at the royal families out of occupied Benelux and Scandinavia and their relationships to resistant movements. The Norwegians and Dutch royalties fled to Britain to support their government in exile and offer encouragement to their subjects via radio broadcast. Meanwhile, the Belgians and Danish monarchs stay in their countries to remain beacons of hope, still close to home. But what about the sovereigns reigning countries that have held on to their national sovereignty? Major players like Britain, Italy and Japan, but also countries such as Romania and Bulgaria. Well, these monarchies are all constitutional in character, meaning they do not really rule or exercise direct authority, but their political influence still holds great sway. And they, their role as figurehead for the nation means they are an essential propaganda tool in remaining national morale. In the 1930s, many of them advocate publicity for peace. Japanese Emperor Hirohito is concerned about the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Under Japan's Meiji constitution, he is the supreme leader of Japan's and commander in chief, commander in chief of the armed forces. But the reality of that is really shown during the Manchuria incident, and it is the political and military leadership who are true holders of power. As Hirito sadly reveals to a court official, I'm striving to preserve world peace, but the forces overseas do not heed my commands and are recklessly expanding the incident. In Italy, King Victor Emmanuel III makes little effort even in his role as a figurehead. In 1922, political pressure to empower the fascist party had become so great that he had little choice to make Benito Mussolini prime minister. Since then, he has taken further steps back from political life still. Mussolini does make great use of him as a figurehead. When Italy invades Ethiopia in 1936 and an Italian emperor is proclaimed, Victor Emmanuel is awarded the title of Emperor of Ethiopia. In April 1939, Italian troops also invade Albania and the Albanian crown is offered to the king as well. On the other side, also trying to preserve peace, is Britain's newly crowned King George VI, or as he is more formally declared by the grace of God of Great Britain, Ireland, and the British dominions, beyond the seas, King Defender of the Faith, Emperor of, Emperor, Emperor of India. He is head of state, as well as head of the British armed forces, but much like Hirohito, his executive powers are largely ceremonial, and authority lies with the elected government. But unlike Hirohito, the king and his politicians see eye to eye. George is a great supporter of appeasement. So that when Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returns from Munich, we all remember that, negotiations in 1938, George invites him to join the royals on the balcony of Buckingham Palace to greet the crowds. 
So, an invitation is a great honor, and King George VI is actually overstepping his role as a neutral head of state by making this move. When Germany attacks Poland in 1939, George's dream of lasting peace are shattered. Just three years after his coronation, he has a war on his hands. On September 3rd, 1939, he declares via radio broadcast, for the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Over and over again, we have tried to find a peaceful way out of the differences between ourselves and those who are now our enemies, but it has been in vain. Queen Elizabeth, wife of the king, I mean, not the future Elizabeth II, who is her daughter, also encourages the British people to do their bit for the war effort, asking them to join her queen's wool fund, which raises money to buy yarn to knit into military garments. You need that sort of thing. So, from the very beginning, the British royals positioned themselves as a rallying point for the morale of the nation. Even just remaining in London is a symbolic contribution to the war effort, choosing to remain at the center of decisions and, of course, the center of danger. To some extent, the Princess Elizabeth and Margaret do the same. But the government is also careful to take them out of harm's way, of course. First, they are moved to the Royal Lodge in Windsor and then Windsor Castle, where they should be safe from Luftwaffe bombs. Here, they do things like joining the local girl guides, attend sewing parties and collect valuable materials for war production. When the London Blitz began, the royal couple takes to visit the badly hit east end of London, but they are not welcome there. Their unsolid appearance amid crumbling houses and those recently made destitute often provokes anger. And on occasions, they are sneered at or have dirt thrown at them. Like, you know, eggs, whatever. Of course, the royal family aren't exactly safe themselves. And the Luftwaffe has been ordered to specially target national monuments, which is gross, I think. And it is only a matter of time before Buckingham Palace itself is bombed. In mid-September 1940, the whole royal family also takes on the burden of rationing. The mm. Queen and the Queen Mother are given extra clothing coupons for garment for state occasions. But inside all their state-mandated ration books, they have the ordinary allowance of coupons for food, soap and other rationed goods. Meanwhile, in Italy, King Victor Emmanuel actually takes some action and successfully blocks Mussolini from entering the war straight away. He insists that his realm is in no condition to wage war, refuses to, to transfer his role as commander-in-chief to Mussolini and demands to be let in on the most important military decisions. The king wants to wait until a winning side emerges, something Mussolini is furiously forced to accept for a short while, despite Hitler's urging him to join. Still, when Germany takes one victory after the other and swiftly invades France, Victor Emmanuel is persuaded by the prospect of quick and riskless gain and bows to the pressure in June 1940. He gives Mussolini his consent as sovereign to enter the war and take operational commands powers over to armed forces. Back in Britain. Everybody is painfully aware of these continual Axis victories. And so 14-year-old Princess Elizabeth now also does her bit by encouraging her fellow Britain children, telling them in a BBC Children's Hour broadcast in October 1940. We children at home are full of cheerfulness and courage. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers and airmen. And we are trying too to bear our own share 
of the danger and sadness of war. We know, every one of us, that in the end, all will be well. For God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. Her father, the king, is concerned with political machinations in Eastern Europe. His distant cousin, Carl, King Carl II of Romania, is forced to flee to Mexico after Prime Minister Ian Antonescu stages a coup in September to bring the country into the Axis allies. Carl has to leave his 19-year-old son, Prince Michael, with Antonescu, who suspends the constitution, dissolves the parliament, and installs the young prince as the new king on September 6, 1940. Michael is crowned on the same day with the traditional insignias of a Roman Romanian king, which in theory makes him commander in chief of the army and gives him the responsibility of appointing the prime minister. But in reality, he is forced to stay in the background of political business. George can do little more than watch, but he does try to ensure the same thing does not happen in Bulgaria, writing to its king, Boris III, on October the 12th, to urge him to maintain neutral. But the Nazi pressure on King Boris is overwhelming. The Bulgarian Tsar is married to Giovanna of Italy, the daughter of Victor Emmanuel III. Hitler hopes that this can help bring Bulgaria into Axis orbit. Even without this union, Germany and Bulgaria were allies in the Great War, and its current government is still very much pro-German. King Boris' ministers have been pressuring him to consent to the law of protection of the nation, an anti-Semitic law similar in scope and aimed to Germany's own Nuremberg laws. He eventually does in January 1941 and two months later gives in to Hitler as well, entering Bulgaria into the Axis alliance. But Boris does not want to support Germany unconditionally. As head of the military forces, he refuses to send regular Bulgarian troops into the USSR and also tries to bypass the deportation of Jews. He looks for ways to chip Jews scheduled for deportation to Palestine and not to German concentration camps and employs Jewish men to build roads so that he can insist on their remaining because their work is indispensable. For Italian King Victor Emmanuel, events don't develop too well. The fascists are secretly planning to rid themselves of the monarchy and have already taken measures to bar him from public life. Newspapers are ordered to leave out even minimal reports on the monarchy's activities and his fortnight meetings with the Under Secretary of War are hushed as well. In January 1941, the king knows that the war is not going well for Italy and that the fascist regime is losing the people's support. But in fear of being overthrown altogether, the king decides to keep his mouth shut. He will soon lose more and more of the support of his people himself. When Rome is bombed in 1943, he will be booed during his visit to the scenes of the attack. on the opposite end of the power spectrum. Emperor Hirito is now actively involved in the discussion and approval of all strategic war plans. He remains an advocate for diplomatic solutions, appointing Hideki Tojo as prime minister in October 1941, with hopes that Hideki Toyo's royal devotion will mean he can be influenced to take the path of peace.
But as we all know by now, that hope is in vain. Either powerless or unwilling to use the power he does have, Hirito finally authorizes the attack on Pearl Harbor on December the 1st? No, it was the 6th. No, he authorizes it on December 1st. Ha ha. Okay. That is several days after the Japan fleet has already set sail for Hawaii. To learn more detail about all this than you will likely ever need to know, check out our 10-part miniseries, Pearl Harbor, minute by minute. The link is below. There. Hirito is, is seen as a deity in his people, now fully locked in a war that has swept the world. Children refer to him as Godhead, and soldiers scream their war cry, Tenno Haiku Banzai, long live the emperor, as they conquer the Pacific world. Despite his apparent reluctance for war, Hirito still publicly supports militarism among his people. On February the 18th, 1942, uh, he hosts a public celebration of Japanese victory so far. He parades along the Nibubashi Bridge in front of his palace on a white horse, waving to a cheering crowd. Princess Elizabeth has her first public outing as heir to the British throne. On her 16th birthday, April 21st, 1942, she inspects the Grenadier Guard in her ceremonial position as their Colonel-in-Chief. After the ceremony, she meets the soldiers together with the rest of her family. Besides taking part in official events like these, the King and Queen still visit the sites of severe bomb damage every day, where they are now by now greeted cheerfully. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Future's husband, the exiled Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark, is an officer in the British Royal Navy. He has patrolled the Indian Ocean and even tasted action himself near Greece during the Battle of Cape Matapan aboard HMS Violent. Royal across the world have faced various trials and fluctuating levels of support. But it seems that it is the British monarchy that has emerged the strongest, leading a land still retaining its national sovereignty and being the very symbol of eventual victory. If popular music is anything to go by, the British people are thankful. In March 1941, the King is still in London, as recorded by Bert Ambrose and his orchestra, with Sam Brown singing the words, the royal standard waves above for everyone to see. The King is with his people, cause that's where he wants to be. The King is still in London, in London, in London, and he would be in London town if London Bridge was falling down. If you like to learn more about a modern king who did actually hold on dictatorial powers full on, you can watch our Between Two War season one episode on King Alexander of Yugoslavia right here. Don't forget to join the Time Ghost Army on patreon.com and timeghost.tv and ring that bell. Mm -hmm.